Okay, we are continuing our study this morning of just some Bible background information, uh, some things that are helpful for us to know um, and to understand in order to have a richer understanding of Scripture. And I want us to spend some time looking at some customs, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to finish this today, but looking at some customs that were, uh, uh, that were known, especially uh, in the first century of Bible times, that that I think will help us to have a better understanding of some of the things that Jesus taught, some of the things that were happening. And I want us to look at these from a religious custom aspect as well as from some social customs. And the reality is that every society uh, has customs. We, we, all, uh, we all have those things that are, that are uh, just natural to us that we understand. Uh, but if you go to another country, those customs uh, may not be as well known. Uh, in those other places. But if we can understand that some of the customs of biblical times, perhaps we'll have a, a better understanding of some things that were happening uh, back then. First thing I want us to talk about in matter of religious customs is this idea of working on the Sabbath. Uh, look, look in Exodus chapter 20. And uh, th this, was a, this was a major issue, as you know, in, uh, in the days of Jesus. But what does Scripture tell us? Look in Exodus chapter 20 where God gives the Ten Commandments. And when God gives the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8, He says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall do what? You shall labor, and in six days you shall do all your what? All your work. What kind of stuff would that involve? You're supposed to work six days a week. What is he talking about? Is he talking about your job? Is he talking about your means by which you earn a living? Six days you are to labor. Six days you're to do those things that are necessary uh, to, to put food on the table, to bring income into the house. But the seventh day, verse 10, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it... You shall do no work. What, kind, what, what, does that, what does that entail? When God says on the Sabbath day, on the seventh day, you shall do no work. What kind of work? No kind of labor? You know, God, in, in Exodus 20, He says, six days you shall work. On the seventh day you shall do no work. But... He generalized it. He didn't specify which work you were to do or not to do necessarily on that seventh day, but he left it more open, which would, which would imply that there's got to be some human judgment that's involved in what kind of work is involved here. We'll notice in just a, a couple minutes here that you remember those times in, uh, in Jesus' day where he healed somebody on the Sabbath. Pharisees didn't like that. Well, what you know, you, you shouldn't be doing work on the Sabbath. Well, is that the kind of work that God told man not to do? Was not not to uh, uh, not to uh, per perform a miracle as Jesus did on the Sabbath? What was it? Was it wrong for them to eat on the Sabbath? Was it wrong for uh, Was it wrong for the wife to cook a meal? on the Sabbath. The Jews, the strictest of the Pharisees in the first century, said it was. Said it would have been wrong to bake anything. Of course, you all are saying, you know, that's great. You know, let's go to McDonald's. You know, that's you're not supposed to bake on the, sa on the Sabbath. The, the Sabbath day, when you look in Exodus 20, and, and it's been up here, there was a, there was a thrust, a threefold thrust for the, for the purpose of this day. First of all, it was historical. Uh, because it goes all the way back to the beginning. On the seventh day and, and the creation week, what did God do on the seventh day? He rested. Did God tell, did God tell Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Seth and Noah, did God tell them to rest on the Sabbath day? The answer is no. God rested on the Sabbath day but he never commanded anybody else to rest on the Sabbath day until you get to Exodus 20. 
And so it was not a, it was not a, a command from creation. It was a command that was given to the Jews. And it wasn't given until it was given to the Jews. So you have the historical aspect of it, the pointing back to say, okay, th this, is, this has some historical significance because God rested on the Sabbath day. But then he brought it to that, to that present day, and there was a practical aspect of it. I know that some of you work seven days a week. When you work seven days a week, does it feel good when you get one week where you only work six? You almost don't know what to do on that seventh day, do you? When you've been working seven days a week, then you get a six-day work week, you're thinking, what am I supposed to do on this day? Because you get so... So there was a practical aspect to it. Is it good to work seven days a week straight without a break? Why not? I didn't hear anybody say yes, by the way. Uh, if you said yes, you need to say it louder next time because I didn't hear you. Uh, why is it not good to work seven days a week straight through? You burn out. Um, answer, answer this. In, in, in regard to God giving this command to the Jews, what should have been the most important thing in the life of a Jew? Not, and, or I could ask, what should be the most important thing in the life of a Christian? And the answer is exactly the same. What's the most important thing in the life of a Jew? Was it his work? His relationship with God. His faith and his obedience to God. Was there anything more important to the Jew? Should there have been anything more important to the Jew than his relationship with God? If that Jew works seven days a week, how much time does he have to give to God? Not much. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Don't do any work on this day. There was that historical, there's that practical, and then there is that prophetical aspect of it. In Hebrews chapter 4, we read about the rest that has been promised to us. And what the Hebrew writer does, remember the book of Hebrews is written to a group of Jewish Christians, so they have a Jewish background. What the Hebrew writer does is to, is to emphasize this rest based upon the rest that God took in the creation week, based upon the rest that the Jews were to take on the seventh day. Now there's a rest that awaits all of God's faithful people. Uh, if, they will, if they will serve him. So here's, here's the premise as we, as we look at this matter of working on the Sabbath. It starts here in Exodus 20 where God, uh, where God gave them a very specific command. He gave it to the Jews, but the problem is that when it comes to this matter of, of applying judgment, that the Jews, especially as we get to the Jews of the first century, they had created a whole system of religion around this command not to work on the Sabbath day. They had created a whole system of traditions that, 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 they, were, that they were not just suggesting that other Jews follow, that they were commanding, they were saying, if you do this on the Sabbath, you're violating the law of God. The Jews, this is not scripture, the Jews said that it would be wrong to go and plant a seed on the Sabbath day. The Jews said it would be wrong to go out into the field and pick fruit to reap on the Sabbath day. The Jews had, uh, had so fixed what was, what was right and wrong on the Sabbath. You couldn't plow a field to the point that in Jewish tradition, they even got to the point where they said it would be wrong for you to spit on the Sabbath day. Because if you spit on the ground, 
then when your spit hits the ground, it might plow a, 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 a trowel right through that, the dirt in the ground, and your spit might be doing work on the Sabbath, so you better not spit lest your spittle do some work on the Sabbath by plowing. That, I'm serious. That's how far they went in enforcing their, their man-made traditions based upon a command where God said you shall not work on the Sabbath. It was wrong, according to Jewish tradition, for a woman to look in a mirror on the Sabbath. Are you kidding me? God said you shall not work on the Sabbath. And the Jews decided, okay, ladies, don't look in a mirror on the Sabbath. Why not? Well, according to what they said, and I know this wouldn't take place today, but they said a Jewish woman, she might see a gray hair, and she might be tempted to pluck that hair. But plucking is not allowed on the Sabbath. Plucking is work. And you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath, so plucking that gray hair on the Sabbath would be wrong. They had built their whole system of traditions around this matter. Look in Luke chapter 6. Here's one occasion where we see this come into play in the days of Jesus. Luke chapter 6, the Pharisees were... Uh, uh, concerned about Jesus' disciples. You ever get the feeling that the Pharisees had some private investigators out, you know, just following Jesus and his disciples around? You, you ever get the idea that, you know, they, they, they had these guys out there with, they're hidden in the bushes and they got their cameras and they're just, they're just waiting for Jesus or the disciples to do something so they, they can catch them in the act and run back to the Pharisees and report what's going on. Sometimes you get that feeling. Luke chapter 6. It happened on the second Sabbath, after the first, that he went through the grain fields. And his disciples plucked the heads. What day is this? It's the Sabbath. They plucked the heads of grain and ate them. Uh-oh. They were plucking the grain on the Sabbath day. Well, it's not a whole lot that they could say about that. Uh, because even they said, well, that might be okay to do. But what they did not like was the fact that they were, when they plucked the grain, that they rubbed it in their hands. And when they were rubbing it in their hands, that was, that was work. The plucking, that was one thing. But now they were threshing. When you start rubbing in your threshing, well, that's work. So some of the Pharisees, verse 2, some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? What was, what was not lawful to do? Was it not lawful to eat? Was it not lawful to pluck? No, it, it, it was okay for them to pluck. They did not like this threshing with their hands, implying that that was work. Jesus answered them. Interesting, the, uh, the pronouns. Look in verse 2. Verse 2 says, Some of the Pharisees said to them, talking to the disciples, Jesus speaks up. Jesus is going to answer them. He says, Have you not read? Have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some of those with him which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. You might hold your finger there. Go, go to Matthew chapter 12. This, um, in Matthew's account uh, of, this, uh, of this particular occasion, we have, a, we have a little bit more as to what Jesus said to them because in Jesus' response, he shows uh, that not all labor on the Sabbath was forbidden. Matthew chapter 12. You'll notice it's the same account because in chapter 12 and verse 1, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry. They plucked the heads. Look, verse 2, your disciples are doing what's not lawful. Jesus answered them, and we've read what he said to them about David. 
Verse 5, he says, have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, have you not read that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple, they profane the Sabbath and they're blameless? What does that mean? The priests, did they still go in the temple on the Sabbath? Well, yeah. Well, when the priests went into the temple on the Sabbath, were they doing any work? Uh, yeah. Jesus says, uh, gentlemen, in your law, the priest on the Sabbath went into the temple, and the priest on the Sabbath did work in the temple. Verse 6, yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. What is Jesus saying? If the priests in the Old Testament were allowed to go in on the Sabbath and to work in the temple on the Sabbath, who's the one who's greater than the temple in verse 6? Jesus is greater than the temple. What does verse 8 say about Jesus? Same thing we saw in Luke chapter uh, 6. What does verse 8 say about Jesus? Who is he? He's the Lord of the Sabbath. Who's the one who said in Exodus 20 that they were not to work on the Sabbath? Was, not, was that not the Lord of the Sabbath who told them they were not to work on the Sabbath? And so in the temple, the priests were permitted to go in there and work on the Sabbath. Well, if the priests were allowed to do that in the temple, who's greater than the temple? Jesus is greater than the temple. Who are the disciples? The disciples are Jesus' men, his priests, his followers. Was it okay for the disciples to work on Jesus' behalf on the Sabbath? Was it okay for the priests to work on Jesus' behalf on the Sabbath? Was it okay for the disciples to work on Jesus' behalf on the Sabbath? Jesus pointed out their inconsistencies in, in understanding uh, but remember, they had made this whole law, they, they, had, uh, they had created this whole system by which they said, you know, it's, it is wrong for, for a man, look in, uh, uh, where am I going? Verse 12, is that what I want, Chuck? Maybe? Chuck says it is, so I know it is. Look at verse 9, we'll get to verse 12, let's just read now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. Behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Why did they ask him that? Verse 10. They're trying to accuse him. They're trying to trip him up. He had just allowed his disciples to pluck, head, pluck, pluck grain and rub it in their hands. Now, uh-oh, you're not going to heal on the Sabbath, are you? What is man... Jesus says in verse 11, What man is there among you who has one sheep? And if he falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not lay hold of him and lift him out? What was the answer to that question? If your sheep falls into the pit on the Sabbath, are you going to say to that sheep, Oh, sorry, buddy, you're going to have to wait till Sunday. I, you know, I, I, can't, I can't reach down there and do anything to help you today. Of course not. Of how much more value then, verse 12, is a man than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do what on the Sabbath? To do good. Was it lawful for Jesus to heal a man on the Sabbath? There's a story in John chapter 12 where Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. And again, the uh, Pharisees ran after him and started accusing Jesus of what he had done. Isn't it amazing that this particular man in, in John chapter 5 had been lame for 38 years? But they were not impressed by the fact that this man who had been lame for 38 years was now walking. How long would it take you to get over that fact? If you knew somebody had been lame and couldn't walk for 38 years and then you saw him walking... How long would it take you to get over the, wow, he's walking. How long would it take you to, to just get over that fact and move on to something else? They didn't care that he was walking. What did they care about? He's carrying his bed. That's work. 
You're not supposed to carry your bed. You're not supposed to carry that pallet. That's uh, carrying a burden. And they said it's wrong to carry a burden on the Sabbath. It is sad that they took the command of God not to work on the Sabbath. And then they started to create other laws. And what they did with their man-made laws is they put their man-made laws right up there next to God's laws. And they said, if you violate our laws, you are violating God's law. Is there anything wrong with that? What were they... Here's, here's partly where their thinking started, okay? Their thinking started partly from the standpoint of, we don't want to violate God's law. Now that's good thinking, right? That's pretty good thinking, don't you think? We don't want to violate God's law. God said not to work on the Sabbath. So in order to not violate that law, they created a hedge... They created a whole bunch of other laws that said, don't, don't violate these laws, that way we don't violate this law. So in order not to violate God's law, don't violate our laws. And their laws were just as important as God's laws. Is it possible that a man-made law, a man-made tradition, could equal what God has said about something? It's not possible, John. They, they, there was that continual conflict between Jesus and many of the Pharisees and scribes because, as John said, they, they had a particular image of what the, uh, the Messiah, the King, was supposed to be like. Jesus didn't fit their image of what he was supposed to be like, so there was that constant conflict. But they, they had a healthy... No, wrong word. They had a respect for the law of God. Not a healthy respect, but they had a respect for the law of God. So much so they had created their own laws in order to not violate it. But what was their problem? Their problem was they had allowed their own law to blind them to the will of God. Is it possible we can create our own ideas and our own traditions and our own wants and our own desires and allow those to blind us to blind us sometimes to the simple and plain will of God Here, here's here's, uh, here's the command in Exodus 20 work six days don't work on the seventh day is that hard to understand I mean if you were living then and, and you were there at Mount Sinai and you heard, don't work on the seventh day. Would you have, would you have been, at, been in a point, oh, I, I don't understand what that means. I'm not supposed to work on the Sabbath? Would, would, you have, have, would you, in your natural line of thinking, would you have got to the point where you thought, it's wrong to carry my pallet, my bed, um, on, on, on the Sabbath day? By the way, the whole carrying of burdens that's prohibited on the Sabbath was a commercial burden. Not a personal burden. The Jews had gotten to the point where not only did they say it was wrong to carry your bed on the Sabbath, it would be wrong to lift your covers off of you on the Sabbath because then you would be bearing a burden. So basically, you've got to stay in bed all day, I guess, which maybe is not a bad thing, you know? Uh, yeah, let's, let's remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honey, I'm staying in bed today, you know, because if I lift these covers... I'm going to be violating work, and so I'm going to stay in bed all day. You try that. You go home and you try that and see. let me know how it works. Uh, I don't think that's going to work so good. But seriously, they had created their own laws to not, to not violate the will of God. Do we need to be careful about doing that? Yeah. God said don't work on the Sabbath. That's not hard to understand. <laughs> 
but we don't need to mount up our own ideas and, and allow those. Look, are, where are you? You knew Matthew 12. Look at Matthew 15. Just, uh, we're going we're gonna to notice this, this concept again. But since we're close here, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, he quotes from Isaiah to talk about these uh, Pharisees and these scribes. And he says, in vain they worship me. What was it that made their efforts vanity? They were teaching what? Teaching as doctrine. Teaching as uh, teaching as the, the will of God, teaching as the law of God, what were they teaching? The commandments of men. Taking their commandments, elevating them to doctrine of God and saying these are equal to each other. They did that with working on the Sabbath. They did that with the washing of hands. On, on other occasions, the, in, in Mark chapter 7, look at Mark 7 for just a minute. Uh, in Mark 7, uh, again, the Pharisees and scribes, they had their private investigators out there. And uh, they, they saw, they, they, they spied on the, uh, the apostles. In uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 2, they saw that some of the disciples ate bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands. And they found fault. Not a good thing. You're not supposed to eat with unwashed hands. Look at verse 3. What's the first word you have in verse 3? 4. They looked and they saw them eating with... Does it bother you to see somebody eat when they haven't washed their hands? Does that bother you? It should. Did you ever teach your kids to wash their hands before dinner? Some of you didn't, by the way, because we, we got some kids that aren't doing it. Did, you, did your parents ever teach you, wash up before dinner? We teach our kids, wash up before dinner. It's a good thing to do, right? Have you ever gone to uh, Subway or one of these places where they make your food in front of you and a uh, person didn't wash their hands before they, uh, before they started fixing your sandwich? You ever... Have, have they ever, well, of course they have gloves on now, right? They, they didn't used to wear gloves. You ever go to Subway back in the day before all these nice regulations where they're making it? I worked at Subway back in the day where we didn't wear gloves. All right? We, we made, we, I made your sandwiches with my bare hands. I couldn't wear those gloves, by the way. That'd drive me nuts. You ever, you ever see somebody makes your food without washing their hands? I was in the subway once, and I had to tell the guy, go wash your hands. He had just checked somebody out with those nice, clean dollar bills, right? And then he came over there to make my sandwich. I said, you see that sink back there? Of course, I told him what I tell my kids today. Use soap, right? <laughs> your kids ever go wash their hands? Okay, did you use soap? Be right back. You know, I'd, then they go back and use the soap. You know, anyway, all right, so... Is it a good thing to wash hands before you eat? Yep. Um, is it a command of God? It would help. It, it, would, it, would it help in your home if it was a command of God? God said, good. well, okay. It wasn't a command of God back here either. So they saw the disciples not washing their hands before they ate. Verse 3, what's the problem? For, that tells us there's a problem. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands. What do you have? In a special, what, did you know there's a special way to wash your hands? I mean, using soap is a good idea. But they not only suggested washing their hands, but they said you had to wash them in a special way and and. Uh, those of you who have been here, you, you've seen and you know how that's been illustrated that they, they could not lift their hands when they were washing them because you know what happens when you wash your hands and they're lifted up. You ever have that water run down your sleeve? Isn't that annoying? So they had to hold them down to keep the dirt from defiling their arms. And there was a special way because you want to make sure that when you use that soap that, that you wash it off properly but then you don't further contaminate yourself 
You ever gone to, the, to a public restroom and washed your hands and then you got to turn the water off? It's like, I just washed my hands and now I'm supposed to touch that thing to turn the water off. You ever done that? Hopefully you're not the person that just leaves the water running because you're saying, well, I'm not going to touch that. So, but they had regulations for that. Laws. Not, not just, have you, it's, it's interesting to go to some public restrooms where they have a little sign that tells you how to wash your hands. Turn on water, apply soap, uh, scrub and rinse. Uh, I'm ser- have you ever seen those signs in a public restroom that tell you how to wash your hands? Beautiful. Okay, so the Pharisees, they had those signs, laws that told you how to wash your hands. Look at the last few words of verse 3. They were supposed to wash their hands in a special way, holding, this is not washing their hands, but this was a, holding the tradition of the elders. The Pharisees held on to what at that time would have been considered the written law. They held on to the Ten Commandments. They held on to the law of Moses that was given at Mount Sinai, and they had a certain respect for that. But the Pharisees also believed in uh, what was called to them the Mishnah. You ever heard of the Mishnah? The Pharisees believed in the Mishnah, and I don't know if I've got this on the slides or not, uh, down here somewhere. They believed in, in the Mishnah which was, you've got your written law, the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses given at Mount Sinai. But there was also what they believed to be an oral law that was given to Moses, but it was never written down. It was words that were given to Moses, but nothing that was ever written down. So it's it's not in your Bible. Because we know that God's law was oral to begin with, except for the finger he used to write the Ten Commandments. Everything else was oral anyway, wasn't it? And Moses had to write it down. But once Moses wrote it down, it was no longer in oral form. It was in written form, so everything was written. But the Jews believed that there was another oral law that was given by God. Never written down. Never written down until about 200 A.D. So if Moses is at Mount Sinai... Uh, about, let's just round it off, 1500 AD, uh, B.C. It's actually probably a little bit later, but round it off. 1500 B.C. They didn't actually write it down until 200 A.D. How long is that? you got 1700 years. Well, if you never write down an oral law, then, then how does somebody 100 years later know that that oral law ever existed? you got to tell them. And so this is a law that passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down, supposedly, not for real, but in their minds, had been passed down for 1,700 years. If you never wrote the law down and all it was was just word of mouth passing it down, how much confidence are you going to have in that law? Um, It's it's like the... uh, the story of, uh, of that, this is not a good story, but I'll tell it anyway. It, it's like the story of that monk, that monk who uh, uh, got a, uh, found, actually found uh, some documents one day that indicated that this oral law that had been passed down to them over and over and over had slightly been mistaken. And... Uh, that the monks were not actually supposed to be celibate, they were supposed to celebrate. And, and somebody, they just left out the one letter, and, and, but for years they hadn't been celebrating, they had been celibate because that's, somebody had just mispronounced the word. Is that not something that can happen with an oral law? You pass it down, you pass it down, you pass it down, can it get changed? Yeah. But the Jews took the written law of Moses and the Mishnah and believed them to be equal. This was God's written law. This is God's oral law. What they thought was God's oral law. And in God's oral law, we have these commands and these instructions on washing hands. And those instructions are just as important as thou shalt have no other God before me. Those instructions are just as important as thou shalt not commit adultery. 
They, they, are, they are equally as binding upon us as anything else uh, that was in written form. And so that was, their, that was their part of their tradition. But what does Jesus say about their tradition in Mark chapter 7? They came to Jesus, and uh, verse 4 says that they also washed their cups and their pitchers and their vessels. They wanted to make sure they were not contaminated by the Gentiles. The Pharisees asked, why do your, scri- why do your disciples... Why do you look at their question in Mark chapter 7 and verse 5? Why do your disciples, whose disciples? Jesus's, the Lord's, the Master, the, the Christ's. Why do your disciples not walk according to what? Did, did, did they? Did they even try to say at this point, did they say, why do your disciples not walk according to the law of Moses? Even they were honest enough, at least at this point, they were honest enough to say, this isn't part of the law of Moses. This is part of our oral tradition that's been handed down. Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? And this is where we saw Matthew's account. This is where Jesus says to them, Isaiah was talking about you hypocrites. These people who honor me with their lips, but their hearts far from me. They worship me in vain because they've elevated their own doctrines to to the level of God. And here's what Jesus says about man-made traditions. Look in verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. If I grab a hold of a tradition of man, that something man has made up, and I hold on to it, what did Jesus say in that verse that I've done with the law of God? What have I done with it? I've laid it aside. Can I hold on to the law of God and to the tradition of man on level ground at the same time. God says, if you're going to hold on to some man-made tradition, you've just laid this book aside. Did the Pharisees think they had laid this book aside? No. They they thought they were honoring this book. Look in verse 9. Jesus said, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Verse 8, they've laid it aside. Verse 9, because they're holding on to the tradition, they have rejected the will of God. We don't have time to look at these middle verses, but drop down to verse 13. What had they done? Made the word of God no effect because of what? Through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Very quick, we've got about 20 seconds maybe, right, Ivan? Is there an application here for us? Is it possible that we could take some man-made doctrine, some man-made teaching, something that a human being has made up that is is, uh, believed to be based upon Scripture and hold on to some man-made tradition and say, well, it's just just as equal as, as as God's Word. God says, there is no thing that's equal to the will of God. The tradition of man is just that. It is a tradition of man. And if you try to hold on to the tradition of man, you've laid aside the will of God, number one. You've rejected the will of God, number two. And verse 13, you've made the word of God of no effect in your life because you won't submit to it. Thank you for your good attention. We're going to continue this next week, continue talking about some of these customs and how they came to play uh, in the first century.